I have saved one issue to the very end because it is highly, highly, highly sensitive. And that is the a hadith that mentioned that towards the end of times when the big Armageddon battle takes place and there shall be Dajjal on one side and Isa on the other, that is the final Armageddon, the big one, that Isa will kill Dajjal. And then all of the followers of the Jal will disperse running for their lives. Many of them will be from that group. And they will try to save themselves by hiding. And the hadith mentions, this hadith is in Sahih Muslim, and there are versions of it in Bukhari, but it's Sahih Muslim primarily. The hadith mentions that at that time frame, the creation will side with the Muslims publicly. I shouldn't even just say Muslims, the supporters of Isa. Because there will be Christians who will support Isa and believe in him, so they will become Muslim. right? And for all we know, there might be Yehud as well, who will choose at that time to be with the truth. The hadith don't mention that all of them will follow. It just says the majority of his followers will be from there. There's a difference between the two. So, it was the hadith mentions that every tree and every rock will say to the believer, Come, there is that person behind. Come and he is hiding. So that the, there is no use to hide. There's no use to hide anymore because the creation of Allah will publicly humiliate and say, Oh, he's hiding here. Come and deal with this person. Except for the tree of Gharqad, that is a tree that will be quiet and not side with the Muslims. Now, Every once in a while, some innocent khatib somewhere in the Western world gives a khutbah and he quotes this hadith. And memory jumps on him. You know what memory is. If you don't, then alhamdulillah for you. Or Fox News jumps on him. Or Pamela Geller jumps on him and takes this small clip and goes viral with it. And says, oh, this is an anti-Semite and he is calling for the destruction and he is Hitler version 2.73 and he is this and that. Bring him back again, right? So it becomes problematic to quote our own tradition because accusations of anti-Semitism come. And a few years ago, there was a University of California would host uh, the MSA, uploaded all of the books of hadith. Uh, once upon a time, if you ever did a Google about hadith, the first one would come, would be the University of California, one of the MSA brothers, he uploaded all of the hadith collections, and it was a great resource. Obviously, these guys found it, and they found these hadith in Sahih Muslim. And they said the university is anti-Semite, or it is hosting anti-Semites. It's hosting Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Right? So the university, it was a big scandal. The university had to get involved. The MSA had to edit and censor Sahih Muslim. Sahih Muslim had to cut a hadith if they wanted to host. And eventually, the whole thing was pulled. There is no longer the hadith collection on their website. It's gone. It's gone. So this raises a very difficult topic. Are these a hadith anti-Semitic? The response I think is very clear and that is that first and foremost first and foremost as a matter of principle as a matter of principle these are traditions that are found in books authored a thousand years ago 1200 years ago you know uh, uh, books of hadith censorship doesn't make any sense are you oh people who are criticizing a book in the past going to censor your own books and not teach them when they have misogyny when they have race issues when they have issues that might be politically incorrect there is hardly a classical book hardly except that there are phrases or notions even shakespeare has anti-semitism read the merchant of venice it is a purely anti-semitic track are you going to ban the merchant of venice are you going to stop it and strip it from being sold are you going to take it and make it of non-available the hypocrisy is ludicrous you don't go back and sanitize history just because you don't like it. Even if you don't like it, it needs to be taught and explained and clarified. That is a matter of principle. That is what liberalism stands on. And when it comes to every faith other than Islam, they uphold it. When it comes to Islam, we see the double standards. That's the first point. Second point, the accusations of anti-Semitism need to be addressed head on. 
They need to be addressed head on. And we need to stop being so defensive. Let us be frank and honest here. Study history, O Muslims. Be educated. Anti-Semitism is a European phenomenon. It's not a Muslim phenomenon. It never existed in Muslim lands up until 1947. Anti-Semitism is something that began in Europe by Christians and it was prevalent throughout their history and it is still around to this day. Muslims were never anti-Semitic. Yes, it is true. Sharia has Ahli Kitab and Muslim. But Ahli Kitab includes who? Christians and Jews. And there's a slightly different Sharia. It's not anti-Semitism. Historically speaking, Muslims and Jews historically had much more in common and they would always bind together against the one who would persecute them and that is the Afranj, the Rum, the Franks, the Christians. Historically, Muslims and Jews had a much stronger relationship than Muslims and Christians and Jews and Christians. Historically speaking, without exaggeration, the greatest minds of the Jewish tradition pre-modernity all of them are found in Muslim lands. All of them, starting from Baghdad and ancient Iran and Andalus and Egypt, you have the greatest minds coming, including Shabtai Tzvi in Ottoman lands. They could not do what they did in Muslim lands. They could not do it in Europe. Every time the Christians persecuted the Jews, Muslims opened their doors. The last time, 1492, when the Muslims were expelled from Granada, the Sultan of the Ottoman land said, you Europeans are fools. The Jews are intelligent people. They're useful. Why don't you come? And he invited all of them en masse to come and live in Muslim lands. And that is why throughout the Muslim world, the largest, sorry, throughout the world, the largest population of Jews before 1947 were in Muslim lands, in Yemen in Iraq, in Morocco, in Egypt. These were where the Jews were. So this whole notion of Muslims being anti-Semite by the very people who defended, by the very people who invented anti-Semitism, please Muslims, educate yourselves. Don't fall for all of this stuff, okay? Also, so that's historically speaking. Let us realize these are hadith. They are predictions, not prescriptions. Big difference. They're predictions, not prescriptions. They're telling you what's going to happen. They're not telling you it is allowed to do it. So, if you believe in these predictions, you believe that stones are going to talk. I believe they're going to talk. But the people who criticize us don't. If you don't believe 90% of it, then why are you believing the 10%? These are predictions of the end of times, of Armageddon, what's going to happen, the apocalypse, the end of the world. If you believe that trees are going to talk, if you believe there's something called the Antichrist, if you believe there's something called the coming of Christ, well then, if you really believe that, fight on the side of the truth, not on the side of evil. End of story. If you don't believe it, these hadith are not telling Muslims to do anything. It's describing what's going to happen towards the end of times. And therefore, if you choose the side of good and not the side of evil, you're not going to have this issue. So the bottom line, we don't have to worry about this charge of anti-Semitism. We need to educate ourselves and challenge it head on. These are not anti-Semitic hadith whatsoever. It's merely describing a battle towards the end of times, the forces of good, the forces of evil. Those who choose the forces of evil will have to suffer the consequences. Simple as that. You don't believe in this battle, then don't quote 10, 10, phrase or 10 words and ignore the 100 word hadith. Don't quote that one phrase about the, the tree is going to say and ignore the whole context. That's being hypocritical. No scholar derives sharia from this. And again, to be brutally honest and blunt here, when the Holocaust was taking place in multiple places in the world, Muslims stood up to defend. Muslims stood up to help those that were being persecuted. This is a fact. The Muslims of France, the Muslims of Morocco, multiple places, they helped the Jewish people. And I have visited those places, Auschwitz and Dachau and others. And I will tell you honestly, and this is a reality that Allah knows, if I were alive at that time frame, 
I would have thought it is something that Allah will reward me if I were to protect these believers from that evil that was taking believers in Allah overall from that evil that is taking place. What happened afterwards, 1948 onwards, is not related to what happened before. If you were alive in 1940, you saw what is happening to this persecuted race, men, women, and children being killed indiscriminately, it would be a part of our iman to protect the innocent from this evil force of Nazi Hitlerism. And that's something that I firmly believe, whether you agree or not, there's besides the point. The point being, we need to challenge this notion of anti-Semitism. It is not anti-Semitic. These hadith are predicting the future, not prescribing law right now. Law tells us we protect minorities. That's what law tells us. Even in an ideal Islamic state, history proves that we protected those minorities. History proves that though they flourished, the Yehud flourished under the lands of Islam like they did not flourish until the advent of modernity in Europe. They were not uh, allowed to do what they were uh, uh, in Muslim lands. So we deny this accusation of anti-Semitism from its complete, as we said, number one, the issue of hypocrisy and double standards. Number two, uh, historically speaking, where did anti-Semitism come from? Number three, the Muslims and the Jews and the relationship. Number four, these hadith are, uh, these hadith are descriptions of the future predictions and not, and not what? Prescriptions, not prescribing what is to be done. So there is no anti-Semitism whatsoever. And we Muslims cannot be anti-Semites because our Prophet was a Semite. Ibrahim was a Semite. The majority of Semites are Muslims. How can Muslims be anti-Semites? Yes, we can be anti-Zionists. And we are anti-Zionists. But we are not people who hate Jews and Christians. No. There's a difference between Judaism and Zionism. Muslims, be careful. Never criticize Judaism and mass unless it's theology. We can criticize aspects of theology. Jews, there are good and bad people amongst them. Christians, good and bad. Zionism as a movement, you have Christian Zionists, as we explained. You have Jewish Zionists. You have atheist Zionists. And we criticize Zionists, but not people of other faith traditions. They're Ahli Kitab. With that, time is up, inshallah ta'ala.